Thank you, everyone. My name is Rob, um, and I'm a soil ecologist. Um, and I want to start talking to you today about the complex system of soil food webs by looking at this abandoned agricultural field in eastern Connecticut. Um, abandoned agricultural fields sort of represent the type of change that we expect to see in ecological systems, right? This was a, a pasture that a farmer was using. It's been partially invaded by native species or non native species that we're trying to get rid of. The native species are starting to come back. It's experiencing the effects of climate change. And we want to know how this system is going to respond to the next 10 or 20 years as we try to manage it. Um, and as we all know um, here today, ecosystems like this one are complex adaptive systems that are really challenging to predict their dynamics into the future. And one of the places that epitomizes this complexity and this difficulty of understanding the soil on which these ecosystems are based. And this is complex for a number of reasons. One of the most practical that like makes my life really challenging is that you can't see through soil. They're visually opaque. And as soon as we take the players out of this complex system to study them independently, we expect their behavior and their interactions to change. So how do we know what they're doing in the soil? And how do we use that to predict how the soil will evolve over time? The second is that soils are highly diverse. About 40% of all living things spend all or some of their life in the soil. So there's a lot of players to deal with in the system. And just like all complex interactions, soils are deal with, they're formed by dispersed interactions at small scales that aggregate up to the level that we care about. How much carbon is sequestered in that soil? How much mineral nitrogen is produced, produced to support plant life? And they're also strongly influenced by their history. This one example I give you being an agricultural system, but you can imagine the variation we see across um, our countries. And just to show you that variation, these two soil cores here, we're taking about 40 to 50 meters apart in the same forest. This one a little lower, so it's flooded more, and it's full of a new species of non-native earthworm that invaded this forest from a nearby golf course. A couple of meters up slope, we have a full soil profile, just like this forest probably had for most of its history. So this is the kind of variability and complexity we're dealing with the system. So I'm going to focus today on one thing we can try and do, which is try and understand how we can take these dispersed interactions and aggregate them together to understand the function of the whole system. And we do this with something called soil food web models. And soil food web models are a type of model that we use to characterize these relationships. And then with that characterization, predict the aggregated effects of these organisms on soil food web function. Um, and so this is just an example of a simple soil food web model. It's a little challenging to read with, on the projector, but basically we have different organisms that are connected by links representing energy flow through the system or carbon or nitrogen flow. And this allows us to track what organism eats what and how that carbon is moved through the system. From basal resources at the center here, this center node is decomposing organic matter. We have inputs from roots, plants, all these things that contribute to the dynamics of the soil. For those of you who are interested in the workings behind this, there's only one slide with math on it, I promise. These uh, soil food web models are built on this idea that the change in the population of the organisms within the soil is a summation of what they eat, how quickly they die, and how much they're eaten by other things. Um, and so we create a little budget for ourselves here. This is a system of differential and all that system of differential equations. The one thing that we think is going to be a problem to study outside of the context of the soil food web, and that is what they're eating and how much they're eating. We can measure the, the length of their lives, how much we expect them to die. We can measure their basic physiology in the laboratory, but we can't, as soon as we put them in a box in the lab, we think they're going to start interacting and eating different things. So this allows us to calculate, at least theoretically, what that looks like in a real soil system. And we put together our package to do all this. So if you're you are inclined, it's on CRAN and it's on GitHub. So find on there and it's all soil food. So today I want to talk about two specific challenges that we deal with working in this data limited system and how we sort of not really fully satisfy our desire to study the system as a whole, but how we can sort of take the system apart and deal with these problems together. The first of those is developing auxiliary methods to predict how individual organisms' diet are going to shift. 
And this is really taking the adaptive part of the complex systems idea and putting it to the side and trying to deal with it separately. And so we can basically handle the complexity of the system. And the second piece of this is using computational techniques to quantify the uncertainty that we think exists within the network and at least demonstrate what we don't know about what we think this system might be capable of. So I'm going to start here with the first um, example, developing auxiliary methods of individual interactions. And this comes from the idea that soil organisms, their diets are largely unknown. So we have a whole diversity of species. We don't really know what they eat. Um, there's a paper from a decade and a half ago called, ago called the Enigma of Soil Diversity because we just have no idea how these things all coexist together, given that we think they just eat whatever they come across. As a consequence of that, we need models to predict what they're going to eat because there's too many species to deal with. And the models that we were using before we started this work were making these sort of ridiculous predictions that they would eat what was available to them. But most of soil is not particularly nutritious, and it doesn't make sense that an organism would spend a lot of time and energy eating something that's not actually that nutritious. So the nutrient content, the, the nitrogen content, the phosphorus content of the food should help us predict what these animals should eat under uh, and so we can take this decision out of our complex model of the soil food web and try and handle it separately in order to figure out what, what the structure of this web should look like. And the, the trouble, the, the problem that we run into in this system is that there's big mismatches between the quality of the food. So this detritus means decomposing matter. So it's got really low quality, lots of carbon, not very much nitrogen. And then the animal, like a mite, that is a small soil organism, that might eat this food has a really high demand for nitrogen. So what the model originally predicts when we just run forward is that the mites don't get enough nitrogen. And this doesn't make sense, right? This, this, this basic naive assumption about what they're eating doesn't work. We can, we can come up with two auxiliary strategies to solve this problem. The first is we can say that mites are adaptively switching to eating something like fungi or microbes that are in the soil at a higher rate than they would be expected to eat in order to make up this deficit in their nutrition. And when we do that, we can close this negative deficit back up to zero quite quickly by just shifting their feeding over to something. The second option that these organisms have is they can adjust their physiology to pull up on the extra carbon that they got eaten from this low quality food and then that may match their, their nutritional demands separately. So we don't know necessarily what every, we still need to decide which of these two strategies the organism is going to use. But figuring out which of these two strategies they're using is a lot easier than going in to that whole network piece by piece and trying to add up the numbers ourselves, right? Trying to decide what they're eating amongst a whole variety of possible foods. So the second thing I want to talk about today is how we, so we've done that work, we figured out what everyone's eating, we've calculated our model of how these organisms are affecting the processes of carbon and nitrogen movement, sequestration in the soil. But we don't have a lot of information to feel super confident in this model because we don't really know a lot. We can't look inside the soil. So how do we quantify the uncertainty in this model so we can at least tell people who are managing these sites this is more or less what we think these animals are doing in the soil. And this is the effect that would occur if you lost this biodiversity from the ecosystem, right? What's the range of uncertainty? And this, in a modeling context, we call structural uncertainty. We don't know how to put the structure of the network together. And it's a real problem in soil systems because this is empirically what it looks like, right? We go to a soil, we extract the animals and you get something that looks like this. You've got spiders, you've got mites, you've got springtails, all these things that we have to identify. Our taxonomist, like Carlos, my collaborator, comes back this, 
you know, undescribed species, something in the genus, but we don't know the species, immatures, like how do we deal with this information and turn it into something like this, a network, a food web that we can cycle in carbon and nitrogen through. From the 70s to basically 2010, we picked one of these that was developed for a farm in Colorado and just kept using it. And just repeated it and repeated it and repeated it because we had nobody had a better hypothesis. And we sort of said, well, somebody made one, so we're just going to keep using that. The alternative method that we proposed, there's probably not, we can't, the system is too complex. There's probably not the perfect solution. But what we can do is interrogate the options, figure out how much the reasonable options give us, and go from there. This, this really matters for our calculations because model structure matters. If you separate organisms into two groups, into two nodes, it doesn't produce the same model as if you group them. This becomes, it's a, a consequence of genetic inequality. And just to show you functionally, it reduces, if you group, start grouping organisms together too much, you reduce the flow of carbon to nitrogen because it's actually the transmission between organisms that causes this flood that we care about. Um, so the approach that we developed is basically an in silico or simulation, lumping and splitting of these organisms to compare the distribution of carbon and nitrogen flows in order to identify cases where grouping the taxonomy is most problematic and direct empirical scientists towards identifying these are the ones we need to know the most about. These are the ones that the experts need. Um, and just to show you, we can do this in simulations and large simulations over and over again. Empirically, what this turns out to be is if we don't know very much about the physiology of the top predators in the system, that creates lots of errors in our model. Consequently, or similarly, if we don't know much about the nutrient requirements of the organisms at the base of the food web, that creates lots of uncertainty in our model. And so by you know, identifying these couple of empirical gaps, we can say, okay, these are the things we should maybe do a better job of measuring in the field to understand what, whether our models are certain enough, what sort of uncertainty we can reduce when studying soil systems. So in summary, what I've said today are separating the adaptive processes like diet selection from our main model to help us interrogate that problem separately and then put it back into the main model. It's not as satisfying as the full complex adaptive system model, but we are so far from having the data necessary to do that for soil. Um, and when the uncertainty is still large, these in silico comparisons can help us at least get a sense of what's the most uncertain. And, and I'd love to say we can like push go on a simulation and like project what the soil food web is doing, but we're we're pretty far from that. Um, we're we're sort of hoping that automated identification of these organisms in the next decade or so will help us make that possible, um, but we're not quite there yet. Um, and so with that, I'd like to thank Zoe and Carlos, who are my collaborators for a lot of this work. Um, and most of this work was funded by Hensburg. So thanks to them as well. And happy to take any questions. Thank you.